So hello there and you're very welcome to our St. Patrick's Athletic 2021 season launch. My name is Jamie Moore. Around this time last year, we played our last match in front of fans. That win over Cork City at a packed Richmond Park, thanks to that brilliant Billy King goal. A few weeks previously, we were all sitting in Rascals, having a pint or a soft drink and a pizza, looking ahead to the 2020 season. How things changed so quickly, but despite us being apart for now, we're definitely still together. And I think that's been proven over the last year. If you're with us live on Zoom tonight or listening back on our new Saints Weekly podcast, thanks very much for joining us and for all your support over the last year and beyond. We've also got a number of our club sponsors on the call tonight. Thanks for your support, as always. Hopefully this is the first and the last time we'll have to preview a League of Ireland season through a laptop screen. Anyway, let's make the best of it with our guest Stephen O'Donnell, Lee Desmond, John Mountney, Ronan Coughlin and our club president Tom O'Mahony. Over the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be talking all things Super Saints ahead of the big kickoff against Shamrock Rovers on the 19th of March. So let's get the show on the road. And to start tonight, I'm going to welcome head coach Stephen O'Donnell. Stephen, how are you? Good, good. Like you, just echoing what you said, like to welcome everyone in listening tonight and we appreciate all their support. So have a good yes. evening. Now, Stephen, we do have some uh, breaking news and an exclusive for our Saints supporters pack. So drum roll, please. If we were in Rascals, we might actually have some drummers, but we have a brand new signing to announce. You might tell us about our new goalkeeper. Yeah, we signed Barry Murphy, who everyone on, on, on here would, would, would know very well and be very familiar with. So um, we signed Barry today. Um, even though the deadline's closed, you can sign out of contract professional. So we're delighted to get Barry on board. Obviously, he was here the season before last and you know he'll bring, bring a wealth of experience he's been in the league for well over a decade and as I said we have a good young core um, in the goalkeeping group and, and Barry will, will bring a lot of experience to that group now so we've obviously Josh Keeley who came up through the academy a really really very promising goalkeeper 17 years of age and we have Vitislav Yaros who we got in on loan from Liverpool 19 years of age so I'm um, delighted to get Barry in as I said gives a lot of experience and a lot of quality and is a great attitude and application every day he comes to training. Yeah, we actually had an email in today. We invited some supporters coming on tonight to submit their questions in advance. And one question was, would we be signing a third goalkeeper? And <coughs> obviously, with the addition of a new player today is, is, you know, I suppose for you, having had Josh and Vite, and they've both been so impressive in pre-season, but you've spoken about the experience of Barry and also his ability. And, and I know you, you were anxious to try and get a third goalkeeper in, and that's what you've done today. Yeah, exactly. And even from the aspect of, of giving, you know, lending a helping hand to the two young keepers in the sense of what's experience in the league. You know, as I said, he's been in the league for well over a decade. So him along with PJ will will give will give that, uh, you know, a bit of ground in every day with the two young keepers, the experiences of playing in the league and what to expect. So, as I said, the main thing was he's a, he's a real good character. And obviously he was a very capable keeper throughout, throughout his career in the League of Ireland. He was eager to get back in playing and you know, we're delighted to get it done and, you know, it really fills up our, our goalkeeping union. Yeah, I mentioned as well an exclusive for our Saints supporters pack holders tonight. So we're going to announce Barry officially at 12 noon tomorrow. So if people can try and keep the big secret, it would be great. But if it happens to get out, sure, it gets out and we'll announce it tomorrow at 12 o'clock. We'll have a full chat with Barry on our YouTube channel. It's a 10-minute interview, really good stuff with Barry as well, talking about some of his previous spells with the club and hopes for this season as well. So that'll be available on the St. YouTube channel tomorrow at 12 o'clock. We'll hear more from Stephen in a couple of minutes and also our three players. But for now, we're going to go to our club president, Tom O'Mahony. Tom, you're welcome. How are you? You're just on mute at the moment, Tom. If you can just tap on mute on the phone there, please. There you go. Can you hear us? Yeah, all is good. Yeah. So, Tom, we're just going to get a general update from you on, on a couple of bits. The Richmond Arena, the state of the club in the middle of COVID-19. But firstly, as club president, just your overall thoughts on the season ahead and the hopes for 2021. Well, the first thing that I want to say is a massive thank you to everybody who's on the call tonight because they're all people who put their hands in their pockets when they didn't necessarily need to do. Um, I mean, for the second year in a row, effectively paying to go to matches that that they that they know they can't go to, certainly for the next few months, and it's completely out of our hands when that situation will change. But it has it has helped the club stay in business. It has helped the club be competitive for this year which I, which, which I believe um, we are and I think it it proves it proves yet again and, and you know and it's been proven over and over again that one of the very special things about our club 
And one of the reasons we punch above our weight so often is because of the fantastic supporters that we have. So that's massively appreciated by, I suppose I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the board and it's massively appreciated by, by the board. In, ter in terms of the season ahead, um, the great thing about the league table at the start of the season is you're always joint top and you know we're joint we're, 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 we're joint top at the moment but I definitely um, feel optimistic I know Stephen will talk later on about the, the squad that he has assembled but um, we had we had the guts of a great squad last season but it wasn't quite it wasn't quite 100% what, 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 what we needed and I think that we have managed to retain practically all of the quality out of that squad last season and we have brought in some real quality and it's proven quality uh, and it's uh, in particular we've brought in uh, players who know the league and players who are winners in the league but we've also brought in um, potentially exceptional talent in the in the loan signings you know I mean when when when, when I heard the names like everybody else I was on to Google and YouTube and everything immediately trying to find out what I, what, what I could about the likes of Alfie Lewis and and uh, um, I'm going to call, call him Yaros because I don't think I can I, th I think Stephen called him Vitislav is it Vitislav Yaros? Yeah, um, he has his yeah, I mean, bo both of those guys look as if they are players with 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 huge uh, uh, potential. I don't know as much about Nahum, the striker that we've got from Reading, but you know, it looks as if these are young players with bright futures ahead of them, whose clubs want them to get competitive senior football. So it's 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 win win. It's win for the players, win for us, and win for their clubs. And I think when you get that mix of players like that. Um, the very exceptional talent that has come up from our academy, which of course has, it has been an immensely successful academy, um, the quality that we've kept from last year, and the really good players that we've brought in, I think it's you know, obviously with Shamrock Rovers have set a very high bar with their performance last season, and we know Dundalk have a, have a lot have a lot of resources, but uh, I think we're going to give a very good account of ourselves, and certainly a better account than 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 we ended up doing last season. I think over the last year, Tom, we've just seen the impact that the pandemic has had on the world and on people in mm -hmm. Ireland from a personal point of view, people that own businesses, small and large. St. Pat's has been no different. And, you know, we spoke at the start about the thanks that we want to give to our sponsors and also the supporters who have put their hands in their pockets mm -hmm. on a weekly basis over the last year, over the last number of years, and they'll continue to do that. Where are things at at the moment with the club in terms of, of its situation during COVID and, you know, hopes that when, when this is all over that it can be in a strong position? It has been an immensely difficult year, and I mean, I remember, I remember being on television in last April where we had to announce that we were one of the clubs that that was actually going to have to um, lay off our players for a period of time. And I mean, that was a desperate situation to be in, and I would genuinely have feared for the future of the club. Um, doing that helped us to get into a situation because Garrett, uh, they, you know, ended up working out an agreement with the players that put us in a situation that, 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 you know, when the league resumed, that, 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 that we were able to come back and we were able to come back at full strength. And obviously all the discussions about finances for this coming season have been very, very difficult, but we've had this, we, I mean, the players have made a contribution. The sponsors have made a big contribution. The supporters have made a big contribution and we, we would like to think, and, and I should I should acknowledge as well that the FAI and the government have also. I mean, everybody everybody has contributed to this. I think people have people in high places have recognised that that um, there are some things that you need to try and keep going because when people's lives are being messed up in the way that they are, they provide an outlet, they provide an interest, they provide an entertainment, and you know. High level football is seen as one of those things that, that you know, uh, our lives may be being messed up, but at least if we can still follow our team and our team can still play matches, that's, that's important to us. So everybody has pitched in and made a contribution. We just put us in the situation that we have been able to assemble a good squad. We face into the season with a degree of optimism, but the main thing that I suppose everybody's fingers are crossed, not just for for money it's much bigger than money we want to have Richmond 
in operation again. We want to have our supporters watching from their seats or from the terrace rather than watching through a screen. It's, you know, your guess is as good as mine as to when that would happen. You would like to think that it'll be during the season. I certainly don't think that there's any prospect of it happening, you know, before the June or July, but you'd like to think that maybe, that maybe by then it could happen. I have one belief though, um, and it doesn't just apply to sport, it applies to just about everything, it applies to everything that's been hammered by, by um, the pandemic. When we get back to normal, everything is going to take off. Restaurants will be full, pubs will be full, music venues will be full, soccer grounds will be full. And the reason is what has happened over the last year has given everyone an appreciation that they mightn't have had. You know, um, there's a Joni Mitchell song that says, you, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And I think that's the realization. I think people are like, supporters who really enjoyed coming into Richmond are now desperate to come into Richmond. And I think we will be flying and the place will be buzzing when we eventually get back. Yeah, sure will. And Tom, lastly and briefly, if you can, I appreciate, you know, there's a lot of information about the Richmond Arena and what might happen. And if it doesn't happen, what we're going to do at Richmond Park. So you might just explain in as brief terms as you can, the latest okay. on that and, and what's going to happen. Okay, very, very, very briefly. The City Council own the site and have a plan for the site. And there are two hurdles that they have to get across to make their plans work. The first is they've got to get planning permission, which they're applying for in September. And the second thing is the finances of it have to add up. There is a certain amount of money that will be available to them and they have to be able to do the thing for that amount of money. If either of those hurdles, if they don't get over either of those hurdles, they're back to the drawing board, in which case we would hope that our original plan might possibly come back on the table. But they're very confident that they will get over those hurdles, which makes it unlikely that our original Richmond Arena plan will, will, will happen. But Garrett Kelleher is extremely determined about two things. First one is St. Pat's have to have a modern stadium. And secondly, St. Pat's have to stay in Inchicore. So if the Richmond Arena plan is not going to happen as planned for, for St. Michael's, a stadium in Inchicore will happen. Garrett is absolutely determined about that. And the best, the place that we would like to have it, if it proves to be possible to do it, is where we are at the moment. Now, that be, that's a very, very complicated proposition. There's a lot of work going on on that. And the City Council are willing to work with us on that. They've made that absolutely clear to us. If it, can be, if it can't be in St. Michael's, then we hope it can be in Richmond. If it can't be in Richmond, it will be in Inchicore. But somewhere down the line, there is an arena. Great stuff. That's the voice of club president, Tom O'Mahony. And anyone who has questions for Tom who wants to get more details than anybody spoken about or other stuff as well, you can email him. And his email is president at stpatsfc.com. That's president at stpatsfc.com. So thanks a million to Tom for jumping on. Now, still to come, interviews with Stephen O'Donnell, Lee Desmond, John Mountney and Ronan Coughlin in just a second. But if you haven't heard, we have a brand new official club podcast, which is called Saints Weekly. We'll have two episodes every month. It's available for free on most podcast platforms at the moment. We're on Spotify, Google Podcasts and Anchor. We'll be on Apple Podcasts quite soon as well. Episode one has a really good chat with Jamie Lennon, also Dara Burns and Ben McCormick. This show will go up on Friday in full for a season preview. And episode three will be out in the week leading into the Bohemians game. We'll have a Saints in the community update with Dave Morrissey. We'll check in with Ger O'Brien in relation to the academy situation and look ahead to that big derby against Bohemians as well. So keep an eye on our social media pages. You can also hit subscribe and download on those podcast networks and you'll actually get an automatic notification whenever a new episode is available. Stephen, we said hello at the start and we mentioned about the signing of Barry Murphy where nearly coming towards the end of pre-season now. Wins over Cork, Wexford and Cove in friendly matches. One more to go against UCD this Saturday. So it's all systems go for the big kickoff on the 19th. Yeah, uh, like you said, everyone's really looking forward to it. It's getting closer to big kickoff. So as you said, on Saturday is our final pre-season game. And, um, you know, delighted with the boys' application and effort over the previous four stroke five weeks. And everyone's raring to go and really looking forward to the first game of the season. Stephen, how would you sum up pre-season so far, the training, how the group have been trying to bond when they can't actually be indoors together and they can't go to the gym for gym sessions and 
you know, last year, for example, the team went to Cork to Foda Island for a few days and, and that can't happen. And, you know, I suppose from that side, it's disappointing, but you've still been able to train. You've still been able to play the friendly matches as well. Yeah, well, one thing I did say early in the pre-season is, you know, players are often told, everyone involved in football is often told uh, you don't realise how lucky you are. So it's never a true word spoken as of, as of the, the world we live in now where we're, we're so lucky to come in training and have a little bit of interaction and ultimately do something we love every day when so many people around the country are struggling and, and stuck at home and not being able to interact with their loved ones, etc. So, you know, we're delighted. We, we, we know we're lucky. We, co- we, we count our... Um, we count our blessings really that we can go in and do something we love every day. But from the training point of view, obviously with a little bit of a turnover in players, you'd, you'd love to have that social aspect and players get to know each other a, a lot better. You know, I think always think relationships off the pitch lead to good relationships on the pitch. So we're trying to do that as much as we can. Obviously we're handcuffed um, quite a bit in that regard, but you know, players are getting along with each other, getting along well on the pitch, creating understandings. So I'm really delighted with the way the new players have mixed, the way the young players have come up from the academy and trained, and obviously delighted with the players that have been here and the way they've make, mixed with all the different sort of aspects too. So, you know, I do feel there's a good vibe in amongst the place. Um, there's there's good morale and um, good camaraderie, and obviously any successful team needs that first and foremost. The squad that you've built, Stephen, and every head coach or manager talks about, you know, how hectic the off-season is for a football manager. You would think maybe it's, you know, some quiet time, but it's actually the opposite. And you retained a good portion of the lads, as Tom mentioned earlier on, from the previous season. Nine new signings now, including the addition today of Barry Murphy. And you've given first pro contracts to a number of academy players as well. So how happy are you with the group and, and I suppose, the mix of, of youth experience and probably most importantly, people with very good attitudes and very good ability? Yeah, look, ultimately time will tell, um, you know, uh, but I can only speak now as of now. I'm delighted with with the group we've assembled. As you say, my, my, I sort of envisaged when I was a player that uh, managers or head coaches, you know, once the season's done, they go and have a two or three month holiday. But it definitely is the off season's the most hectic time. Obviously, you're trying to negotiate terms with players and keep them at clubs. You know, the way the League of Ireland is, a lot of players are on year deals. So you're having to renegotiate at the end of every season. And then you're also trying to get your recruitment right as well. So it's a real hectic time. But, you know, I'm delighted with the, with the squad we've assembled. I'm delighted with the mix we have. As, as you said, we, as Tom said, we've got some experienced, proven winners. We've got, um, you know, players that know the club that have been here a lot of years, real good quality players. And then we have real good uh, prospects coming up through the youth academy. So I think there's a good, there's a good blend and, um, you know, a good mix. But as I said, ultimately time will tell, you know, we can say all we want uh, on the, in these tor- sort of forums, but, you know, on the pitch is where, where we'll do our talking and hopefully we will. Yeah. Some questions on the email over the last couple of days about the new signings um, from V. Jaros on loan from Liverpool. We spoke earlier on about, Barry Murphy, we've got a couple of the lads in Ronan Coughlin and John Mountney on the call tonight. Sam Bone and Maddie Smith have come in from Waterford. Paddy Barrett, most recently in Cambodia. And name Melvin Lambert and Alfie Lewis on loan from Reading and Massam, respectively. What can you tell us? And I know it's a broad question because there's lots of them, but, but just about the process you went through and the type of, of I suppose, ability and also the characters, because you often speak about characters and that you want good characters in the group. Yeah, to me, that's the most important thing when you're signing a player is... What's his character like? Um, you know, what's he going to be like in amongst the dressing room? Because a couple of bad characters and, and, you know, you can do all the good work you want. But if you have a couple of bad characters, you know, that will that will tear up everything you're trying to work with. So character wise, I think that's a huge thing. Um, obviously, they have to have ability, but, you know, there's no point in having really good ability if the rest of it, the application, the attitude and the character is not there. So. As you said, they all have different attributes. You know, I have different relationships with, like, I would have played with a couple of boys we signed, obviously. So I, I would have, I would have worked with them on a different, in a different sort of relationship as a player, as a teammate. So I'd know really truthfully what what their characters like. I would have seen them day in, day out in the training pitch. I would have played games with them. Others I would have admired from from afar, uh, playing against them, or probably not so much playing against them, but even my previous job with Dundalk, going to watch matches like Ronan, I tried to sign Ronan, uh, met Ronan on the last off-season as well. Player I've admired the last two or three years, delighted to get him on board. Then other ones from overseas are ones, um, you know, you trawl through the under-23 academy matches, seeing if there's 
any prospective signings that could be available maybe the parent club wants them to go out and loan you do your homework there you watch on Y Scout you watch full games and then you make inquiries and see if it's a, a realistic runner so it's all sort of different uh, you know as it's all different relationships as I said other players that I would have played with you know when they're out of contract you ring them up and see if it's something that would interest them and then you take it from there so as I said, it's it's a big mix, uh, different relationships with different people, but ultimately, from what I've seen since they've come through the door for the first day of pre-season, I've been re- very happy with. And how strange has that all been, particularly with the UK boys, but also with lads in Ireland, you know, during the middle of the level five lockdowns, everything has had to be done on phone calls and on Zoom calls like this. And you probably never thought when you were playing or when you became a head coach that you'd be, you know, trying to sign a player through a laptop screen and maybe, you know, you're trying to get a handle on what they're like as a person, but you can't actually shake their hand and look them in the eye and, and speak to them. Yeah, exactly. Look, thank God for technology, especially, I suppose, with with the players from Britain or overseas, you know, um, it's tough for them as well. They're going somewhat into the unknown, at least the boys in Ireland, from their perspective, from a player's perspective, they know to a certain extent what the league's about, what, what the club's about, what, what they're getting themselves in for. But it, it is tricky when you're trying to sell sell something to a a player in England that's in a a youth academy. So uh, lots of Zoom meetings with representatives, with obviously club representatives and the players themselves. And you try and sell the club as best you can. And I'm very confident every time when I'm talking to a player, especially in England, is once they get step foot in Ireland, they see the standard of players they're going to be playing against and playing with, see the standard of training, that, that they'll enjoy themselves. But the biggest one is trying to get them over, you know, and trying to sell... The League of Ireland and, and say it is a really good breeding ground for young players and you can use it as a stepping stone to go on to, to bigger and better things or ultimately if that's not the case League of Ireland is a very good standard in its own right there's lots of really good very good players really good clubs and um, you know you can have as I did mainly in, in the main you can have a really good career domestically you know as you know the likes of Ian Birmingham have and a, a lot of brilliant players that have played for St. Pat's have had really brilliant domestic careers. And just on that, people like Ian Birmingham, when you bring in nine new signings and then you have four or five academy lads in the group too, the likes of an Ian Birmingham or Lee Desmond, Chris Forrester, Jamie Lennon, Shane Griffin, Robbie Benson, as some examples who know what it's like to play in the League of Ireland, know what it's like to play for St. Pat's and, and the importance of, of, you know, people training properly and people being professionals and people, you know, doing everything they can on a Friday night or a Saturday to win a football match, to have you know, six, seven people in the group like that is, is invaluable, isn't it? Yeah, it's huge. Every Look, you go down through the years, every successful team, be it here or or overseas, there's a core there that it's built on. There's a core group of boys that drive it from the dressing room that know what, what the clubs they're at are about. You know, this is how you do things. This is how you win things. If you want to do it this way, you'll be successful. So them core group of players, they're, they're you know, you've hit the jackpot if you have a real good core core group of experienced players that are driving it and it's something I feel we, we do now have and uh, something I'm delighted with but you need the dressing room really driving standards and, and players you know um, if someone is stepping out of line it mightn't even go to management it mightn't go to coach and staff the players are there to nip it in the bud hey you know you got to do that better if you want to be serious about your football and that and I do think we have a serious group of players now who are very serious on their career be it youngsters that do they want to play really well and maybe put themselves in the shop window or else experienced players more experienced players that say hey I want St. Patrick's Athletic to be to be successful I want to go and win things here there's definitely an opportunity so you know I think we do have a good blend of that and we have now a dressing room I think that will police it and they will they will demand standards from each other yeah and something that we're all you know very excited about is some of the academy players as well Stephen you gave senior debuts last year as teenagers to Ben McCormick and Dara Burns, four more academy players in Josh Keeley, Keen Kelly, Keen Corbley and Kyle Robinson who's just gone alone to Wexford have signed their first professional contracts as well and all are still young enough to play 19s for at least one more year if not longer and their I suppose excitement and their energy and training and their want to impress and their ability as well has just been really nice to see and, and I'm sure you know that you have a really good young group of lads there that if, they, if, they, if you do need them and you do give them a chance that they won't let you down. Yeah, exactly. You said the, the main bit at the end is ability. You know, the, like Ben and Dara didn't get first team starts last year because it would look good for academy graduates to be playing in the first team. They got they got start or they came on in games and appearances because they were good enough and they were showing up well enough in training. 
and I felt it could make a difference when they come onto the pitch. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Like the players have to be good enough, the young players, and even for their own self-preservation, they have to be ready. So I'm not going to throw a young boy in if I feel he's not ready and that could be detrimental to his own career. He might have a bad experience coming on in a game or starting a game and he's not ready. And then that could deviate his, his sort of, um, how would I, you know, his trajectory. So they have to be good enough. They have to be ready. They have to be mature enough. And, you know, they showed that to me and to all the coaching staff in training. And, you know, I've been delighted with their attitude. To, as you said, um, all good ability, you know, all really nice lads. And, and from what I've seen so far, all really serious and wanting to be footballers. Is that the squad completed now until the July window? Yeah, I would think so, yeah. Um, you know, as I said, the window's closed. That the only players sort of available now are out of contract pros. But um, I'm happy with the balance of our squad. As I said, I'm happy with the mix of our squad. So, um, yeah, that that that'll be it. We had the launch yesterday for Watch Why, even though it's been known for a while that it is coming back up until the mid-season break. So our opening night of the season again, Shamrock Rovers live on TV. The next 13 matches will either be on TV or on Watch LOI and then LOI TV will take over. We do hope to have at least limited supporters back in the grounds by then, Stephen. And we've missed the supporters so much. They've missed us so much. And, you know, Richmond Park is such a special place to be at a football match. I know I've never played in a football match there, but just being there as a journalist and, you know, when the team scores or there's a big match or whatever, it's just an incredible place to be. And when the atmosphere is rocking there, it's, in my opinion, the best place in, in the country, you know, to be involved in a football match. And you guys haven't had that for the last year and the supporters haven't had it for the last year. Um, I suppose the fact that we have hundreds on the call tonight and more will listen to the podcast. What do you want to say to them? Yeah, well, even from even though I've never played for St. Pat's, um, you know, the general consensus amongst a lot of players in the league will be, it's the best away ground to play on if if you come uh, with with an away team, and that's because of the atmosphere, it's because of the pitch, it's because of the terraces and the stands so so tight to the pitch. So it is a great little arena. But I can see, I think you can see, um, overseas games. I think the home records are sort of gone out the window now. Home advantage that's basically because of fans. You know, um, there's nothing like playing a home game, as you said, at Richmond. I've I've only I've only experienced it a handful of times now as a manager, but. When the team gets behind you, there's no doubt about it that the players get that extra 5, 10, 15 percent and really puts them on the front foot. So, like, you know, I saw Klopp, I think he said a couple of days ago, football won't return to normal really until fans are back in the stadium. And it, it's no different. It's not, you know, as, as Tom said, the league needed to go on in the sense of people saw how important it was. I, I'd like to think it gives our fans something to look forward to on, on the television or on League of Ireland Weekly every week. But it's not going to be the same or it's not going to be proper football, what you'd call proper football when you turn up on a Friday night and the crowd's bouncing and it's a Dublin derby. It won't be proper football, as I would describe it, until that happens, you know. And, um, you know, I can't wait to come in. Hopefully when it does happen, we'll be very competitive and, and the fans will be will be really eager to get down to Richmond and back us and they'll really like what they're seeing from a team that, I'd like to think they'll have no doubt every time they come down or every second week or every time they go away from home that they'll have no doubt in the application, the efforts of the players, every game they play. Look, you're going to have games, you're not going to be at your best. We all accept that. I accept that. Um, fans will accept that once they see, you know, 100% effort and, and knowing that the players are leaving everything out there. You know, that's all I think people can demand of players. That's all I demand of my squad. And um, I'm really looking forward to getting Richmond back. As I said, them big Dublin derbies, them type of games. You know, I think it is the best place in the country for for a game of football, and um, I can't wait for to see a return. You're on mute, Jamie. Yes, I will mute myself. That would actually help. Last question, Stephen. In terms of the opening games of the season, Shamrock Rovers away, draw at home, Bohemians away. Fans or no fans, there's obviously three points on the line for each match, and, and you know, important football matches with so long off for the players and stuff. I suppose just your thoughts on, on the opening runner fixtures. We've six games then in April and, you know, the games will come thick and fast. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, unknowns regarding the league this year. Um, there's been turnover in players with, with, with a lot of teams. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, as you said, we have, I suppose, the top three uh, that came first, second and third. They're our first three away games. So not an, not an easy start. Um, but, you know, you're going to have to play all these teams at some stage. So, First game of the season, playing the league champions. Um, as a player, don't think you can ask for any more than that. It's going to be live on television. 
live in RTE. So every, it's a game we're looking forward to, a game we're going to be ready for, and a, a game we're going to be preparing uh, to to the tenth degree for. And like that, um, all I'll be demanding of my players is hundred percent effort, hundred percent application, and belief. Belief being the huge thing. Believe that you're going to do something special this season. I think we have that, and with the talent we have, I I, I am very I'm very much looking forward to the season and working with this group of players. Stephen, thanks for meeting the best of luck. Thank you. Now, we'll have our players panel with Lee Desmond, John Mountney and Ronan Coughlin in just a second. But just a reminder, we're doing our best to keep everybody up to date as much as we can, particularly in times when you can't come to watch the team in person across our social media channels. We're already on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. We've also increased the output on our website for written articles if people like to read stuff as opposed to watch or listen. And we're now on TikTok. So those TikTokers who want to give us a follow, it's St. Patrick's Athletic FC is a TikTok handle. And we're already the biggest League of Ireland club on TikTok with over 10,000 followers. So thanks to everyone who's followed us so far on that platform. It's, it's a really new, engaging, interesting stuff. We'll have lots of behind the scenes content from you know, training and matches and, and stuff as well. So it's St. Patrick's Athletic FC on TikTok. And those watching tonight, if you're taking any photos of the laptop or the iPad, or if you're streaming us on the TV, feel free to pop them on your social media. Our hashtag for the season is hashtag St. Pat's FC and we'd like to get the club trending as much as possible throughout the year. So if you are tweeting or Instagramming or Facebooking or TikToking about us, etc., hashtag St. Pat's FC is the uh, one to use to try and get us trending. Lee Desmond, how are you? How are you, Jamie? Yeah, very good. Thanks yourself. All good, yeah. Lee, as the only one of our three players tonight who was with the club last year, how would you describe 2020? Crazy year, really. Um Started off okay, league form and four games in. I remember we were preparing for Dunlock away on the Friday, and we got the we went into training on the Thursday morning and got told the game was off. And I think originally we thought, oh, little weekend off here, you know, and then back in Monday. But little did we know, three and a half months later, we'd still be off. Yeah, you played that pass for King Billy's winner against Cork. Richmond Park was packed. The buzz I spoke about on match night was there for everybody to see. It was an electric place to be when you played that ball from midfield and he took the touch and finished and celebrated and it secured points. And it was a great night at Richmond. And, you know, we haven't had fans bar, I think, a couple of hundred in Cork for the away match at game since. And there's a question in on the, on the chat from one of the supporters tonight, Lee, just asking what's it been like as a player playing in empty stadiums and, and all that goes with that? Well, it's something that you do get used to fairly quickly. Um, you just have to adapt, I suppose. But, yeah, it's just not the same. Uh, little did we know that that court game was going to be our last game in front of fans. And I think, as Tom said, when when everyone's allowed back in the ground, we're going to see full stadiums for quite a while and probably have to get used to that again. And I'll probably be... Um, quite nerve-wracking again like like it was when you were starting off playing as, as an 18, 19 year old in front of fans but yeah from the players point of view we can't wait to get fans back in the ground because that's one of the main reasons you play I suppose Yeah thanks to Adam for that question in chat anyone else who wants to send me a question feel free to send it on for the lads or for Stephen or Tom also Lee the season was suspended then for almost five months and eventually a half season of 18 games 14 more after the four that each team had played behind closed doors how much different were those games for you as someone who's been in the league for so long? Um, I mean, you're going into your seventh season now as a St. Pat's player. And, and I suppose, how did you self-motivate to, to ensure that if you did need that extra kick that the fans would usually give you that, that weren't there? Like even the Sligo win, for example, which we'll speak more with Ronan about in a moment, the away fans, you know, on that night as well. It's, it's it, like it's impossible to replace. Yeah, there probably were certain... Um, occasions where we could have used the fans um, but then again like you could communicate better and stuff like that with players on the pitch but um, yeah certain games I'm sure the opposition would say the same that they would have benefit from having from having their home crowd but as I said you just get used to it and you know you, you just have to get on with it uh, really on the pitch but it's not the same and we just want to get the crowds back as soon as possible and get back to normal. I know, Lee, you're not really into social media, but I know you're also fully aware of the different ways that the supporters have supported the team virtually behind gates. There was a great picture of Stephen O'Donnell and some supporters outside Finn Park were there outside the gates and Stephen is inside the gates because he's involved in the match. The same up in the Roy McBride, Brandywell and Derry of, 
of supporters literally above the wall watching trying to watch the match and obviously a lot of people watch from home virtually and, and supported us through social media so you guys have definitely still felt and will continue to feel their support until they can physically come back in the stadium yeah we're definitely aware i mean it's something that's spoken about quite a lot we're aware that like even tonight you see so many people on um i mean it's tough times for everyone and you know, it just sort of opens opens our mind up to how important like the club is and the team is to so many people. So, yeah, like from a personal level, it's important to us because it's it's given us something to do every day and given us a focus. But uh, you know, we're having an impact on a lot of people's lives as well, which is which is really good. Yes, certainly the the opportunity to to put smiles on people's faces during this time and wherever they are in Dublin or in the world. And, and something that I suppose has, if you can say there's anything good has come from this, that supporters, St. Pat supporters, not in Ireland. I know at times you can't watch games because of the blocks on streaming and blocks on RTE and stuff that they've been able to actually watch the team. We've had messages from fans all over the world. And it's nice to know maybe, you know, your involvement in a win and there's a supporter somewhere miles and miles from Ireland who, who's there in their St. Pat's here supporting the team. Yeah, obviously we have a lot of fans overseas as well. I know there's a lad in Australia that I was talking to last year and I think there's a, a supporters club in Brazil or Spain as well. So those things are great, but even for the fans at home, um, no, it's really good. We're, we are aware of the support and as I said, like, geez, hopefully now July, August, we can start getting smaller crowds back into the stadiums. Yeah, and those with a 2021 supporters pack, will put themselves first in line, depending on the numbers that were allowed into the stadiums. If we have to do draws or, or there'll be a certain way that we'll be able to do things fairly. But if you do have a supporters pack, it will certainly help your chances of being one of the select few allowed in because numbers will be low initially before we can get full crowds back into the stadiums as well. Lee, lastly for now, and we'll do a round table with the three players at the end and some quick fire questions. Going into your seventh season now as a Saint, you're 26, I'm right in saying? Yeah. So only Burmo in Birmingham is here longer than you. How would you describe your relationship with the club and how it's grown over the years and what it means for you to be a St. Pat's player? Because clearly the fact that you've signed back every year, you know, shows, I suppose, what you think of the club and what the club thinks of you. Yeah, I've always really enjoyed playing for the club and for the fans. But the first couple of years, it wasn't so easy. But over time, you know, relationships develop. And uh, I've always said it, it's, it's like a family club now. Um, you know, you see the same faces every week and the same people are still working in the club when I joined seven years ago. So, yeah, I'm happy to be here and really looking forward to it this season. Lee, thanks for meeting me chatting in a few minutes. No problem. Now time to welcome one of our new signings to our supporters launch for 2021. John Mountney, hello. Well, Jamie. How are you? All good, all good. John, you've faced St. Pat's many times as a Dundalk player. I remember some big games back in 2013. St. Pat's, I hate to tell you, won the league against Dundalk by three points and some big matches at Orioles, some big matches at Richmond. I'm sure you've got some memories of, of St. Pat's v. Dundalk matches when you were a Dundalk player and now you'll be on the other side of the, the table come the 19th of March. Yeah, um, and going back to, to that day, 2013, you know, I remember Pat's were the team to change at the time and you know they played a great brand of football and like you said we finished three points um often that season and and you know that's who we, we were chasing then the following year was to to try and do better but um no, i remember they did a great side yeah like w when you were playing in, in those matches and you know steven spoke earlier on about richmond being a, a place that away players like to play in because of the pitch and the atmosphere but also when the same pats fans are able to verbally What's my word here to choose carefully? Verbally shout at the opposition players, particularly if you're on the Camac side or wherever you might be in the ground. Um, it, it's the same in loads of grounds, but particularly if you're in the gantry in Richmond, and there's a, I think Sam Bowen said it when he signed, that he was right back for water for the opening night of the season. And uh, he was certainly told that he needed to, he needed to, you know, make sure he played well on that night because St. Pat's fans were trying to make things difficult for him. Is that something you experienced? Yeah, and I think it's been been said a couple of times in the chat about uh, how good of a ground it is. And I remember my first time coming into the league, and and you know, experience and playing playing there away was was incredible. It's of course a lovely little ground as you as you step down into it. And then um, you know, like I said back then, two thousand and twelve, thirteen, and even a little bit past that, they were successful at the time. And I remember it was a full house, and you know, it was very intimidating as a as a young lad coming and playing away. And you know, I think actually the last time we played them. The season they uh, won the league in 2013, there was, I think there was nearly three and a half thousand at that game, you know, so it's, uh, you know, it's a great venue. 
you're looking forward now to the other side and I think Lee spoke very well there about you know looking forward to having the supporters back you'll make your Lee debut at Richmond against Strata in front of no supporters but hopefully we can have some in to, to cheer you guys on and for you to experience the Richmond Park atmosphere as a home player yeah yeah please God Jamie um you know, like we said, it's it's uh, an intimidating place, and and like and like when that happens, and we can get the fans in, um, you know, it'll be intimidating for other teams to come. And and I'm sure, or, um, from last year, watching on the Watch League of Ireland, fans would have would have seen the way um, Stephen has the team play, and then you know, it's it's an exciting brand of football when when having the ball and then without it, it's 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 a high work rate. So I've no doubt the fans will will get behind us fully when we, when we get back into the ground, and and please God have a successful year together. John, you've had time now to settle into being a St. Pat's player with the preseason and the friendly matches as well. After so long with Dundalk, how did you go about, you know, I suppose, getting used to playing for another club and I suppose getting to know the players? And as Stephen mentioned earlier on, that's been difficult with no gym sessions and no real way to, to, to bond apart from actually on the pitch. Yeah, like like you've, you've touched on it. That's the difficult side, but um, you know, as soon as I had agreed to sign, I, I was already had a friend there, Robbie Benson, and you know, I touched base with him a lot over the the off season, you know, to sort of find out about lads and and like that, I was looking forward to like all the lads getting back in and and getting to meet them because you know, haven't seen a lot of their their games last year and played against them, they were they were a very good side and hard to play against. So like that, I was looking to. Um, to getting to know the lads better and you know build relationships on the pitch and I think we've been uh, we've been going in a good direction. Yeah, you know you are one of the more experienced players. You've played in Europa League runs. You've played in you know massive games for Dundalk and you'll now be playing in massive games hopefully for St Pat's as well. How do you feel your experience at that will help at St Pat's? You know, firstly your own performances, the other players, the new players, the younger players, and and I know when Stephen did speak when when we announced that you'd signed about you know, how much that big match experience, you know, that you would lend to the group? Yeah, of course, um, you know, like any player coming, you, you want to bring as much as you can to the to the team and the group to uh, to push on. And like that, I'll be trying to bring as much as I can personally. But, um, you know, it, it's pulled from a lot of different directions, you know, like not just experienced players, like that's been said, there's, there's young lads coming through that are, you know, are showing their talent and really pushing and, and, and keeping other players on, on their toes and um, everyone sort of pushing everyone on this, what I've seen so far. And, um, you know, there's, there's a good balance between it all. Yeah, question for you, John, from Adam in the chat saying, what will it feel like having worn the Dundalk jersey for eight years to pull on this Empaths jersey in Tallis Stadium next Friday? Uh, yeah, it'll be very exciting. Um, do you know, it was, it was a proud moment putting on the jersey in the first pre-season game and... Like I said in the off season, it was very exciting to you know to get in and, and get going meeting the lads and and that's why you train hard and, and you you work work hard in pre season is is for the Friday nights or Saturday games um to go out there and and to win as a group and you know when the fixture list came out I think you know everyone in the league does be excited for it and and us as a group at Pats you know we were very excited by the start we have and um you know we're full of confidence going into that now next week. Lastly, John, that word win and winning and winning mentality is used quite a lot in football. And that's something that you've got used to doing. And, you know, in pre-season with the way things are this year, we can only play against first division teams. And, you know, the intensity of those games has been very good, but it, it won't compare to Shamrock Rovers away or Drought at home or Bohemians away. Tell me about that, you know, winning mentality and, and wanting to win at all costs and, and, you know, what you guys will be willing to go and, and do in terms of, of attitude, application and stuff to to ensure that the team does their very best to try and win these big football matches starting next week? Yeah, well, I think anyone with a competitive nature, you know, wants to win at the end of the day. And like that, that feeling on a Friday night, um, you know, there's nothing better when you come in as a team and, and you've left nothing on the pitch and, and you've picked up three points. It, you know, you're, you're going home on a good form that weekend and, you know, you're, you have a real bounce in your step. And, and obviously the... The opposite when when you don't, the results don't go your way, you know you're dwelling on the match and thinking about it and waiting for the next game to to make things right. So um, you know, like I said, you can't beat that feeling of of winning on a Friday night. And please God, we'll have we'll have plenty of experience this year. John, thanks a million. Welcome again. We'll chat to you again in a couple of minutes. Thanks, Ronan Coughlin, our other new signing on the call. How are you, sir? Not too bad, Jamie. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thanks. Not too bad. Not too bad. So. 
you scored on your first appearance in the friendly in Cork a couple of weeks ago, a nice volley early in the game, some nice play by Jay McClellan, then you smashed it into the net. So a nice way to start your career, albeit it's only pre-season. Strikers talk about wanting to get into good habits in front of goal. And I'm sure you were happy to, to start things off with a goal there and, and how your first few weeks have gone. Yeah, no, like you said, obviously it's exactly what you want, I suppose. I think it was my first touch as well. Um, lovely set up by Jay. But yeah, it's exactly what you want. And um, yeah, hopefully you can bring this into the season now. Um, we've been working hard and we can't wait to get going as well. Is that important for a striker and an attacking player, you know, just to ensure that you are hitting the back of the net in, in you know, some pre-season matches to get your confidence up and stuff? Yeah, definitely for a striker. It's probably going to be on your mind, isn't it? But to be honest, it's not something I think about when I went to a game. Obviously, it's what I'm there to do, but there's other more important bits like working hard and doing your best. And then I just think the goals will come. Spoke there to John about the reasons he signed for St. Pat's. Why did you want to become a Super Saint and how happy are you to have signed? And I suppose we're a little bit out now from the opening game. So the excitement is definitely building for everybody. Yeah, no, definitely. Like I said, like I spoke with uh, the gaffer probably two years ago. Um, and then obviously last year, and I was keen then, but probably probably just didn't suit the timing when I was at Sligo. Um, and now, like I had another chat with him and everything just, it just made sense to come. Um, and it's definitely been the right decision from the first four or five weeks in pre-season so far. He's been right with everything he said and I'm obviously delighted to be here. And um, yeah, I can't wait to play. Hopefully, like we've been saying on the call, that we hope we can get the fans in soon because I don't think I've ever won at Richmond like as an, as an away player. So I'm definitely looking forward to winning there and then with the fans to be a bonus. Yeah, interested to get the perspective on the other side and, and being you know a home player when you're playing against St. Pat's and that game in Sligo which was a 2-0 victory at the showgrounds. I think that was our first away game of the season and it turned out to be one of only two away games, that and the Shells match when there was fans at the ground. And I got sent some fantastic photos and videos from the away side of the showgrounds of the supporters at the final whistle um, when the game had been won. I think Ronan Hale and Chris Forrester got the goals and a couple of years previously, Mikey Drennan scored a last-minute winner mm. there as well and there was unbelievable scenes. And the St. Pat's fans away from home are fantastic as well and they make unbelievable noise it'll be the opposite for you this year when they come back in they'll be cheering for you as against you in the away games but you played that night in the showgrounds and I'm sure you could really hear the Pats fans yeah no definitely I remember the two nights you're on about um, I remember it was my first game actually for Sligo was uh, against St. Pats and when Nicky Jones scored the last minute and I remember the scenes and then the one you're on about now was the, I remember it was wet and windy typical to like Sligo weather but I remember the fans as well no, it, was, it was lively to say the least and now things will be on the other side. And you must be so excited as well about the attacking players that are going to be around you. You know, we spoke earlier on about, you know, the new signings in, in Matty Smith, but people like Billy King and Jay McClelland have been great since they signed for the club. Stephen spoke earlier on about the younger players and someone like Dara Burns is an exciting player. Add in Chris Forrester, Naeem Melvin Lambert, Robbie Benson. The list goes on of other attacking mm. players in the group. And I know you guys have been working hard in training to, you know, to, to work as a, you know, as an attacking force and create chances, score goals, etc. So, for you as as someone that that you know might play as a striker, you must be quite excited to have those type of lads around you. Yeah, no, definitely, it's something you notice know straight away when you when you come in. The boys around you, like you're saying, like Maddie Smith, especially coming in from Watford, have a big signing, and like the boys that are here, like you're saying, um, Billy King, Benson, and all them, and even the young lads, like even their their quality as well. So. Definitely, there's a lot of attacking options and not even just that they're good with the ball, but good characters and, like we're saying, good lads as well that want to work hard and want to win things, which is most important, your attitude. And, yeah, no, I can't wait to get on. Yeah, we mentioned earlier on about not being able to bond off the pitch, but there has been one way you guys have bonded. I'm going to unmute Lee and John here in case they want to put their tuppence worth in. But uh, Rona Coughlin claims to be the best FIFA player at St. Pat's. And um, there's something called a 99 card, which he's looking for to get, right? And um, we're at the moment, there's going to be a thing called the ELOI and a supporter is going to represent Pats because he won a tournament. But Ronan was disappointed he wasn't included in the tournament, blah, blah, blah. I understand Josh Keeley is quite a good FIFA player and I think Shane Griffin wanted to possibly give you a run for your money as well. So I don't know if the lads can, can, can confirm this or Ronan himself, but you are the FIFA king of St. Pats, are you? And you have been trying to bond with the lads via the, the FIFA calls or whatever they are? Trying to, yeah. I'm not sure if the two boys play, but... Um... No, Griff, Griff's definitely not, not anywhere near the standard. Um, bashed him and played Sam Bowen as well, bashed him. Don't know, I don't know about Josh. Um, but yeah, I was, like you said, I was disappointed not to be able to play 
in that tournament because I saw Longford, one of their players, is their FIFA. Yeah. No, player former for player, a former, a former player, not current. Which? It's a former player, not a current player who's going to be their player in the FIFA. Oh, is that it? Yeah. But anyway, yeah, well, I'm still disappointed in you, but I don't know, maybe I'll get a shot. So, Mountain or Lee? I can't, we... uh, I can't back him up. You can't? You're not a FIFA man? No, I just said I can't back him up. I have nephews that are only five years of age and they'd both beat me at FIFA, so I can't argue with them. I see. I, I see. don't play myself, but they are, the boys talk about it a lot every day. I think Billy King says he's decent as well, does he, Rob? He uh, tries to, like, yeah. But that, they all say that until you play him. Like. We'll finish with some <laughs> quick fire questions, lads, in just a second. Lee, there's a question from Damien O'Brien in the chat for you. And it says, how did you feel, how did he feel, as in Lee, how did Lee feel about re-signing this season as a fan favourite? Was it a tough decision? I think I know the answer. No, it wasn't. It wasn't a tough decision. I've seen there. Uh, well, obviously I've worked with the manager now the last nearly two years. And uh, yeah, I think I've improved a lot as a player and I can see what direction the club is going. And we've we've signed the players now that, uh, that show we're going in the right direction. And, you know, it's early days, but... I have to say there is a sort of camaraderie in the group that hasn't been there so early, considering that we can't do much with each other, um, can't do anything at all outside the training ground. So, you know, there is relationships formed and that's only going to get better and, and we'll bring that onto the pitch. So lastly, lads, a few quick fire questions for all three of you to answer. Some sent in by supporters as well. Uh, on the team of the FIFA, lads, away from football, what do you get up to? I know we're in lockdown at the moment, but hobbies and interests and, and maybe things to take the mind away at times from football. Anyone want to jump in? Just jump in. Go on, John. <laughs> um, nothing that exciting, Jamie. For me, it's trying to keep busy in the house. I um, I always like having a project. Like at the minute, I'm building a little bench, built-in bench to the wall. And then once that's done, I have a fence to rebuild out the back. <laughs> Very exciting. Lee, any, anything more exciting going on with you? There's not a lot to do, is there? Um, just doing a bit of studying and that and, and trying to trying to get ready for life after football, I suppose. But uh, you know, there's not a lot to do uh, socially, really, at the minute, is there? I think, though, you have a little dog that gets, gets extra walks at the moment, don't you? The dogs are benefiting from COVID the most. They're getting walked twice a day. Ronan Coughlin, bar FIFA and your FIFA addiction, what are you getting up to to keep yourself <laughs> occupied? Um, not much like the boys have said there's not much you can do like try to get out of the house when we have a day off like going for a stroll or something like this is other than that it's just chilling out and recovering for the next day so lads one each a Netflix Amazon Prime Disney Plus recommendation for the people watching and listening that they might get onto in lockdown that you've watched that you love that you think people should should go for I'm doing Ozark at the moment and it's very good yeah, a very good Jamie Ozark. That's a good recommendation. But another mm. one, if anyone was a fan of uh, Breaking Bad, there's a new show out, isn't there, called Your Honor, which uh, I don't know if it's on Netflix or any of them yet. It's on it's Sky Atlantic. Very good. Sky, yeah. Yeah, Sky Atlantic. Yeah, that's worth a watch for anyone. Lee, what's your Netflix? Yeah. I was telling our assistant manager, Padge Craig, to watch a mad one the other day. Um, it's called Operation Odessa. Uh, I don't think many people know about it, so give that a watch. Ronan? It's just what Mount was saying. I've only started watching Your Honor as well on Sky, and that's pretty good. Yeah. I think he's finished it, but I've only got a few more episodes, and that's quite decent. John Mountain, you've been in training now for five or six weeks. Who do you hate facing in St. Pat's training the most, and why? The toughest, the toughest opponent, or someone you have good old training battles with? We've seen some of you in the last few weeks now. Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a few of them. Um, from a defending side, I, I'd probably say Billy King is, is tough when he stands you up. You know, he can he has step overs, he can go inside or he, he has that shift as well. He can go down the line. So Billy is tricky and um, Jay, Jay McClendon as well is very, very tidy coming infield as well. He's, he's hard to take the ball off. And then uh, going the other side, attacking, um, I'd have to say Lee, you know, he gets tight to you. Uh, he's not afraid of foul either. And then, of course, he has uh, has pace if, if you look to push it past him. Lee and Ronan, has there been any Levy Ronan battles in training so far? Or Lee, how have you found trying to deal with all of our very talented attackers? Yeah, I was only, I think I only said it to the manager a few weeks ago. Ronan is tough. Uh, you know, when he gets his body in front of you and pins you, he'd be one of the stronger lads in the team, gym wise. So, uh, 
yeah, Ron, Ron's tough to mark from a centre half's point of view. Ron is Lee the toughest defender, or do you have anyone else that you that you like having to train and battles with? Um, yeah, he's, he's definitely up there. Probably the same with Mounts. Two boys are strong. You know, they're both fast as well, so it doesn't help. Um, and yeah, defensively, I don't I don't really have to do much, but maybe in the five hours, maybe a little Dara Burns. I think I kicked him over twice the other day in training. Gave him a bit. Well, this is not my game, like so he can skip past me, I'll just take him down. Ronan, in your experience of St. Pat so far, who would you say is the smartest person in the squad? Um probably just go with Robbie Benson, isn't he? Just like a clever fella now. And he's always talking about stocks as well. So just and I've heard he's clever from Rome Mary told me before, so I just Probably him. I'd say Mel's about me up on that as well. I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to say different, but it has to be Robbie. Yeah, he's different level. I think his IQ has dropped. His IQ has dropped massively hanging around with the likes of me and different lads <laughs> over the years. But every now and then when you hear him in a proper conversation with someone, it just opens your eyes to, to how intelligent he is. As Paddy Barrett would say, he's a nerd. <laughs> Lee, are you the same? Are you going for Robbie or someone else? Is this on or off the pitch? This can be either, but I'd say off the pitch more so. Yeah, well, I can't really deny Robbie Benson. He's a clever guy. Lee, match day routines, superstitions, etc. What's your gig for, say, Shamrock Rovers game Friday, seven forty-five? How will you How will you spend your day to be ready for kickoff? Yeah, you just you're just trying to pass time, really. I suppose. Um, ideally, like as a player, I think a lot of people say you want the matches earlier on in the day, um, just because there's a lot of waiting around and. And you're trying you can't do too much because you're trying to keep your energy and trying to be very specific with your eating but the key is just staying relaxed i suppose and just treat it like any other day and then go and do your business that night mr Mountney. yeah no real superstitions as such um when i was younger maybe but now there's no superstitions or there's no routines really just always listen to music i suppose on match day and, and like like uh, lee said waiting for the time pass to pass by Yes, if supporters want to go on to Spotify, search John Mountney St. Pat's Dressing Room Playlist. Is that right, John? That's correct, yeah, but I, I wouldn't advise anyone to listen to much of it. Yes, so if the people want to listen to what the players listen to, maybe before the match, you can actually find that on Spotify and have a listen. It's actually very good. So, yeah, that's uh, I think John is the DJ of the group. Uh, last couple, lads. Um, if you weren't a footballer, John will say with you, if you weren't a footballer or maybe after football, what, what, would, you like to, what would you like to do? Why retire um, all your millions when you when you when you you know win the lotto or that afterwards? Yeah, no. Well, I suppose we have a, a family uh, business pub back home in in Mayo, so um, I suppose I'd probably be take over that, be a barman like I used to be as a young fella. Ronan, for you, anything away from football or plans for for afterwards? I think Ronan might actually be gone. He didn't like oh, yeah. FIFA. I knew someone's phone would die. Well, Lee, for you, you're 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 in college, so you're you're studying. You're 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 doing some education away from the football. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do after football. Maybe something down the line of psychology, or maybe even go into coaching. But uh, hopefully, have uh, a good few years before I have to decide for sure what I want to do on that. Ronan Cochran is back. Ronan, after football, or if you weren't a footballer, what would you do? What would you be? And your phone, um, is, your phone is sideways, by the way. Oh shit! Yeah. Um, I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't a footballer, but um, maybe when I'm done, I'd probably, to be honest, it's a bit boring answer. Probably stay in football, be a coach. Um, maybe a few other kind of things on the side. Um, but yeah, I probably can't see myself doing much else. Last three lads. If a series of League of Ireland games were moved to any other country in the world, and you could play a St. Pat's match in any stadium. What stadium would you pick and why? Lee, you can go first. Definitely uh, Borussia Dortmund Stadium. I was lucky enough to go there uh, with my dad two years ago for a Champions League match and the atmosphere is just second to none uh, with the yellow wall with 18,000 fans. It's, I think it's the biggest stand in Europe, so I'd love to play there. That would be the dream. And for an extra point, Lee, can you remember the name of that stadium? Signal Aduna Park. Excellent, you'd win the team quiz. John Mountney, where would you like us to play a match if it wasn't in Richmond? I'd make it a nice easy one for the fans and it'd be a trip over to Manchester to play in Old Trafford. Okay, nice. Any reason why you're obviously a Man United fan, are you? 
Just, yeah, boy, boyhood, um, growing up Man United fan, so that'd be the one to play in. Ronan? Um, yeah, I spot Liverpool, so I'd probably say Anfield, but I don't know, I've been to the San Siro and that was pretty good. I watched Inter Milan play when I was younger and that was up there with Anfield, so we don't want them. Yes, I said we'd be finished by the Champions League, so I'm very sorry, we will be finished in two minutes. Uh, last two questions each. Um, Lee, what are you looking forward to most about the season? Probably just looking forward to seeing how we get on because I'm I'm really excited about the group of players we have and uh, you know obviously in months to come it'll be exciting when the fans start coming back going, coming back in but for now um you know I think it's going to be an exciting year I don't want to say too much yet but as the manager said time will tell uh, but I think we're going to have a good year yeah Ronan what are you excited about Yeah no definitely just like Lee said um, don't want to say too much but definitely excited about what I've seen in the last few weeks and um, the training, the intensity, the running, I suppose it's going to pay off, isn't it? So that's what I'm looking forward to the most. Yeah, get going now and shams. John? Yeah, I think the lads have, have covered that question. It's it excites me most is getting back into competitive games, you know, um, playing games on a Friday night for a reason and for a purpose. And, you know, that feeling, that feeling hopefully when it, when it is coming together of uh, doing well together as a group, you can't beat it. Lastly, lads, three words or less for your last answer. Lee, then John, then Ronan, please. What did you first think when you heard we were away to Shamrock Rovers on the opening night? Three words or less? Yeah. First thing that came to your mind? Buzzing. Yeah. There you go. There's one buzzing. Let's win. Good. Mount. Happy days. Great stuff. Lads, thanks a million for jumping on and good luck for the season. Cheers. So that's it for our 2021 virtual season launch. Thanks to our guests, Tom O'Mahony, Stephen O'Donnell, Lee Desmond, John Mountney and Ronan Coughlin. And of course, the hundreds of Saints fans who bought a 2021 supporters pack and jumped on the call tonight. Dave, Carl, John and everyone else who helped make tonight possible. You can listen back to tonight's full preview on our Saints weekly podcast from Friday ahead of the Shamrock Rovers game on the 19th of March. And to finish... There was a line in an email sent out to our supporters last night by Carl Stafford from the office, which I think sums up perfectly where we're at at the moment. And it read, please know that just because we're physically apart now doesn't mean that we're not still together. At some point in the future, we'll all be sitting in a packed Richmond Park cheering on the Saints. And the time away will make every trip to Inchicore that much sweeter. And we can't wait for that time. Stay safe, folks. Have a great night. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.